Pastor Cole, I want to thank you and Experience Church for hosting. You've been a, you've been a great host, and uh, we're able to do our radio program earlier today. And just thankful for this town hall meeting, and thank you all for being here tonight for this important town hall for life. You know, it was a year ago that the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade after 50 years. And what the court did, the, the court did not outlaw abortion. It simply put it back into the hands of your elected officials to determine what the standards would be. Fortunately, we've had about uh, 27 states that have taken aggressive actions to protect the unborn, but we've seen some back away from this issue. And so tonight we're going to talk about what is the proper role for our elected officials. But I want to start with you, Pastor Cole. I'm going to put you on the spot. Why a town hall meeting in a church on the issue of life? Well, you know, a lot of churches and a lot of pastors, a lot of believers kind of backpedal and step away from the tough stuff because we don't want to offend. But, you know, if we're honest, Scripture is offensive because it, it requires us to die to our flesh and live to the Spirit. And I believe that the church has been quiet too often for too long on the moral absolutes of God. And I believe the church needs to rise up and take its stand again as, as really um, a driving force for policy as well as for moral issues that, that God stands for. Because as you and I were talking earlier, you made very clear that abortion is not a public policy issue. It is a moral and a spiritual and a biblical issue. It is. It is. All life um, is, is a biblical issue. So it's not, it doesn't matter, you know, what color you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter the country of your origin. What matters is life matters and God created life. So as believers, we need to start stand up, not just privately in our own minds, in our own homes, in our own churches, but we need to stand up loud and be very proud that we are supporters of life in our community. Yeah, very good. I'm reminded of the scripture, Jesus said that he came to give us life and life more abundant. Amen. And we're defending that life tonight. As our panelists come up and onto the stage as we get ready to begin our town hall uh, gathering. Again, I, I want to put this up on the screen very quickly. For those of you who are joining us online, you'll see that you can submit questions. Uh, if you're watching, there will be a QR code on the screen. Take a snapshot of that. That way we'll be taking questions throughout the night. But well, it's a privilege for me tonight to introduce to you our esteemed panel. Senator Lindsey Graham has been, a, has been leading the way in demonstrating a need and a responsibility for a federal role to protect the unborn in post-Roe America. He is the sponsor of the Protecting Pain-Capable Unborn Children from Late-Term Abortions Act, which would restrict uh, uh, abort would protect children at the point where they feel pain at 15 weeks and they can suck their thumbs. States are free to do much more, like uh, here in Iowa, where you had a heartbeat bill until your court last week uh, stopped that. Uh, you would be free to do that, but there would be a threshold level. So, Senator, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your leadership on life. Marjorie Danafelzer is president of Susan B. Anthony. Marjorie is the president of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America. With Marjorie at the helm of America's largest grassroots pro-life political organization, the pro-life movement succeeded in electing a pro-life president and Senate confirming three U.S. Supreme Court justices in overturning Roe v. Wade. She has been named to Politico's power list of 40 influential leaders for 2022. Marjorie, thank you for being here tonight. Myra Rodriguez is a former Planned Parenthood clinic manager turned pro-life advocate. She was a whistleblower reporting safety and health violations like incomplete abortions, falsification of patient records, illegal conduct, unreported statutory rape, and severe injuries by abortion. In August of 2019, after she was fired, she 
sued Planned Parenthood, and a jury of her peers unanimously awarded her $3 million in damages by Planned Parenthood. Myra, thank you for being with us tonight. Bob Vanderplatz needs no introduction to this crowd here in Iowa. He's president and CEO of The Family Leader. The Family Leader is a pivotal organization in Iowa's coalition of pro-life leaders uniting Iowa's most prominent pro-life groups in the common defense of life. Bob, thank you for your leadership and thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. Senator, we're going to jump right into this and I'm going to put you first. Why are you here in Iowa? I love the ocean. <laughs> I got some bad information. Uh, now I'm here because Iowa matters if you want to be the Republican nominee. The road to the nomination runs through Iowa. It's the first stop. And I'm here to tell my fellow Republicans, <clears throat> you should want to talk about abortion, not be afraid of it. Right? right? After the Dobbs decision, our Democratic uh, colleagues have introduced legislation in Washington that would create a national standard. It would overrule every state law, Tony. It would allow abortion on demand, taxpayer funded, literally up to the moment of birth. Okay, if you're a Republican, <clears throat> you should be against that. If, if you're like 70% of the country, 80% of the country is against that. Why are we having a hard time talking about an issue where 80% of the people are against what they want to do? If you can't talk about this, you're not going to do well. <laughs> okay? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, you've heard those phrases? It's pretty hard to pursue happiness if you're dead. So here's what I want to say to my Republican colleagues. I ran for President Tony. If you don't remember that, it's not your fault. I didn't do very well. <laughs> Somebody asked me what happened to you and Trump. I said, well, I said every bad thing about him I could. I got to know him. I come to like him and he likes him, so we got that in common. <laughs> but you got some really qualified people on our side coming to Iowa. Check them out. And here's what I hope they'll say. That what the Democrats are proposing is barbaric. Like China and North Korea allow abortion on demand up to the moment of birth using government money. But 47 of 50 European nations limit abortion between 12 and 15 weeks. I never thought I'd say, look to see what France is doing. They're at 14. So my bill, Tony, will create a national minimum standard. You can do more. You can do six weeks. You can do whatever you want to do at the state level. But at 15 weeks, I want to draw a line for the soul of America. Yeah. What good comes from aborting a child who sucks his thumb, can feel pain at 15 weeks in the birthing process. That is a reasonable position to take. And if you're running to be the standard bearer of the Republican Party, it should be easy for you to say the following. If you send me a bill outlawing abortion at 15 weeks where the baby can feel pain to operate on the child, you provide anesthesia because we know they feel pain, I will sign it. If that is hard, you're in the wrong business. That's why I'm here now. Just for the record, Senator, I, I don't remember when you ran, but I remember your cell phone. Yes, my <laughs> cell phone did better than I did, yes. If you want to get your cell phone blow up, blow, blow it up, give Trump your number. Yeah. <laughs> He'll tell everybody. So, Marjorie Dannenfelser, when the Senator says this is the defining ground, for the Republican presidential candidates who will come to Iowa first, they will campaign. What do you, what do they need to be saying? And, and who's saying it right, right now? Well, first we're looking for a presidential candidate that knows the country well enough to know where to find an ocean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that excludes me. Yeah, I don't think there's a competency test out there. But when it comes to life and death, and you have called yourself a pro-life public official, you don't get to the starting line after 50 years 
of blood, sweat, tears, prayers, 63 million children dying, you don't get to the starting line and say, I'm done. You say, this is my vision for the future. No more, no more death in this country because we just don't care to lift a finger to pass laws that save lives and serve women who deserve so much more than a cycle of poverty, a cycle of abusive relationships. They deserve so much more. What I'm afraid that we're seeing is a lot of fear at the starting line. And what we want to see is a race run well, having, having worked out, having built your team, and running the race well to the end. And the end means every single child in this country is protected. That's the end of the race. So since Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America is the uh, election arm of the Pro-Life Amendment, we care so much about what happens in Iowa. You have so much power to influence the country in terms of saving the lives of children intended for this world for purposes only they can accomplish. So thank you for, for making it clear to each of these presidential candidates what you expect when they get here. Thank you, Marjorie. And, and by the way, folks, there, there are resources available. Simply text the word LIFE, L-I-F-E, to 67742. That's 67742, the word LIFE. And you'll have a whole list of resources from the different organizations that are working on the LIFE issue. Myra, I want to go to you now. Um, you worked with Planned Parenthood. Uh, you are now an advocate for LIFE. What are you hearing as you travel, not just here in the United States, um, but as you travel in Central and South America and other places, what are you hearing about the concern over life? People really don't want abortions. I mean, Senator said it, 80% are against it in most cases. Some people think that it's the less evil because they don't want to see the kids on the street, right? And, and there's always comes down to a social justice issue, right? that it's not being addressed by the politicians we elected, right? So you go to Colombia and abortions are being pushed to nine months too. You go to Mexico and it's the same issue. When you talk to the people on the street, they don't want this. I got the fortune of touring Hawaii in February and the people in Hawaii, a very liberal state, a very, how can I say, permissive towards abortion like Hawaii, they don't want this. You know, most people don't even know that abortions are happening after 20 weeks that are happening for any reason. There's no rape victim. There's no medical problem. Simply, I just don't want to have this baby now because there's a social issue involved or there's a reason why that woman feels that she needs to have that. But in reality, the majority of people, the citizens in the street, the normal working people, especially the Hispanic community, you know, we're very protective of our families. That's who we are. That's how we were raised. You know, we, we don't put our grandparents into hospice homes. We keep them with us, right? And we do the same thing with our children. So to come and tell the Latino community, you know, kill your children, it goes against everything we believe on. And, and you're, you're right, there's the educational issue here, and this goes back, Senator, to your point of you've got to talk about this because you, people don't know how extreme the Democratic Party is on this issue. And, and to that point, Bob, I want to ask you about this. What are Iowans expecting to hear? What do they want to hear when it comes to this issue of life? Well, Iowans are very wise. They're very savvy. They are not easily enamored. Iowans are really good about authenticity. Do you believe what you say to be really real? And that's what we're looking at for the sanctity of human life. We want a champion for the sanctity of human life because they believe it. Not because of what the polls say. Instead of reacting to the polls, we want this person to shape the polls, to shape America's thinking on this. So one is we want a champion for the culture of life. You know, our enemies, as Senator Graham just talked about, you, you look at North Korea, you look at China, you know, they'll champion a culture of death. That's not America. We're all about a culture of life. All of us here from Iowa, we, we've seen it before, we've heard it before, where that kid is lost in the cornfield, right? And we will move heaven and earth, will we not? 
Neighbors stop everything and they're in that cornfield to find that child. Why? Because we value a culture of life. So we want to champion for the culture of the sanctity of human life. And we want them to be clear on this issue, not nuanced on this issue. When they start talking about, well, they said this, and I don't know if we can do this, or let these guys do, that's a nuanced approach. But what you want to do is you also want to have a standard to bear say, I will be the champion as President of the United States to hold Governor Newsom in check, who wants to have abortions up till the time of birth, and he becomes an abortion destination. There's definitely a federal role that they need to play. So when they say the federal government has no role to play, as Marjorie said, this is the beginning of it. And guys, we're winning. And the reason we're winning, God creates it, nature reveals it, and good science will always back it up. And good science is on our side. Thank you, Bob. And uh, by the way, we, we've got a question for you. Do you think there is a federal role for Congress in protecting unborn children? Senator, I'm going to go back to you for a moment, and, and we're just going to open this up. There doesn't seem to be any hesitation on behalf of the Democratic leadership right. on a federal role on this issue. In fact, yesterday at the White House, the First Lady, Jill Biden, uh, hosted an event called A Conversation at the White House on the Impact of the Dobbs Decision. And this is what she said. I'm just going to quote it. She said, quote, the Dobbs decision was devastating and Joe is doing everything he can to fight back. But the only way that we can ensure that every woman has the fundamental freedoms she deserves is for Congress to make the protections of Roe v. Wade the law of the land once again, end quote. So uh, Schumer said, Senator Schumer said today, they will not stop fighting. They're going to be unrelenting in passing a law in Washington that will allow abortion on demand up to the moment of birth. This is not about codifying Roe. That's not what they want. Roe said there's a compelling state interest after viability. That's probably 22 weeks. There's not one Democrat that would support a limit on abortion at 22 weeks, because that's not what the left wants. So the state's rights issue. In my state, we argued for the idea that some people should be able to own slaves, and if you don't want to, that's okay. We were wrong. This is a human rights issue. Does it really matter where you're conceived? If you're conceived in New York or California, you name the place, at 15 weeks, all of us have the same journey to get here. The one thing that me and Schumer have in common, we were zygotes and we got, got over that. <laughs> so the point is, science tells us at 15 weeks, the nerve endings of a child are well developed to the point you have to provide anesthesia if you wanna save the baby's life because you don't wanna hurt the patient in the name of healing the patient. Just imagine what it's like to be dismembered. Folks, this is a human rights issue. It's not geography. It's always about the child. So to my colleagues who feel like the state should have the power to regulate this issue, I agree with you up to a point. And here's what the court said. Federalism doesn't dictate barbaric outcomes. Kavanaugh. On the question of abortion, the Constitution is therefore neither pro-life nor pro-choice. The Constitution is neutral and leaves the issue for the people and their elected representatives to resolve through the democratic process in the states or Congress. Like the numerous other difficult questions of American social and economic policy that the Constitution does not address. To those who say the Constitution requires me to be quiet as a United States Senator and just suffer quietly as babies are aborted up to the moment of birth in parts of this country, no. The Constitution does not require that. Dobbs did not uh, make that the ruling. It's quite the opposite. Nobody took on Kavanaugh when he mentioned Congress. So this idea that the states or the only game in town is wrong. There is not a close for business sign out in front of the House and the Senate when it comes to the unborn. And when they come to Iowa, you need to let them know that. Marjorie, in fact, just today, um, 
you have some new polling data on this, not that we make our decisions by polling, but it shows us where the American people are. And we, we've heard repeatedly that in the midterm election, 2022 midterm election, that this was a liability for Republicans. Now, it was a liability because they didn't talk about it, but when you compare in contrast the positions that the senator just laid out, the one that the, the, when a baby feels pain, sucks its thumb, where Americans stand on whether or not that life should be protected, juxtaposed to where the Democratic Party has stated a position, abortion up until the moment of birth and beyond, where does the American people stand on that? Well, where they stand is 59% uh, um, of Americans think that the Congress should pass a law 15 weeks or better for, for a minimum standard. And 24% uh, and of the people think that there should be unlimited abortion up until the end, paid for by taxpayers. Now, any, I'm, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I can tell you, I've never run for office, but I can say that if I were looking at those numbers and I was thinking of running for office, I would completely embrace that 59%. I'd also embrace every single other poll out there that reflects the goodness and common sense of this country. 77%, 70 to 72, this is NPR. This is not, you know, not our side. NPR, Marist, uh, Harvard polls all say that they that the good good people of the United States support at least a 15 week limit. So, if you're running, which I hear a lot of people are running for the president's presidency, <laughs> go ahead and capture that 72% and do not be afraid. Be not afraid in the in the confrontation that you are going to have because you're going to win with a 72% issue versus a 10% issue. The only thing you must do is what you said, Bob, communicate with clarity what your position is with no nuance, and then you're gonna be golden. On, the, on that GOP stage, or that debate stage, the clearest and the most ambitious and the most confident in this position should be the one that wins. But the one who won't say anything or said it's a federal issue only, will not win, I believe, in Iowa or South Carolina, and it means they won't be the president of the United States. You know, Marjorie, that's well said. And I think, you know, what, what Senator Graham said about being a federal issue or a state issue, it's not federal or state, this is right or wrong. Right. It's a right or wrong. That's why you don't have slavery in Iowa, but you don't have slavery in Missouri, right? It's a moral issue, it's right and wrong. And because this comes down to elections, the reason the Democrats are doubling down, why Joe Biden, Jill Biden are doubling down, Schumer's doubling down, Newsom's doubling down, we're gonna give abortion all the way up to the time of birth. They believe it's gonna win an election. And the reason the other side's become a nuance or being concerned of it, they're thinking that's gonna lose an election. But think if you had a champion for the sanctity of human life, who said, I can't wait till America embraces all life till the time of conception to natural death and every day gets to be lived out as God ordained it to be. Think about if you had a candidate message that and capture the imagination of a great country that celebrates the sanctity of human life and they win. Because when they win, you know what happens? All these other politicians who said they're pro-life at a chicken dinner now become pro-life. <laughs> because you know what, it wins. Because at the end of the day, isn't it right, Senator Graham? It's all about re-election. Mm -hmm. It's all about, can I have that office? What we want somebody to do is be motivated because it's embedded in their DNA and I'm gonna be a leader and I'm gonna lead this country to the sanctity of human life. I'd like to add on to that because you asked me a question that I didn't answer before, and it's who's doing a good job so far? Mm -hmm. Mike Pence is doing a beautiful job, Asa Hutchison has done a good job, and Tim Scott has done a fantastic job. I think they're, they're clear uh, enough for the moment that they're in. It'll be even clearer when they get here to Iowa. And I just want to say, the pro-life movement has always been about what? The child. So when you hear somebody say our Constitution requires us to sit on the sidelines and be like China and North Korea, you're wrong. The Dobbs decision was clear. Elected representatives through the democratic process at the states and Congress. That's the Kavanaugh uh, uh, concurring opinion. Nobody took issue with that. So here's what I hope our party will do. If you walk in the room and you're just worried about getting elected, nothing else, you got two choices. You can take a position where 80% of the people are against what you want to do, 
or 70% of the people of far what you want to do. What would you do? <laughs> I'd pick the one where most people are for me. How do we live in a world where the, we're taking a position that 70% of the people like, and we're afraid to talk about it? That's nuts. Yeah. Let me uh, tie kind of, some of several of those comments together, because if you go back to the 2022 election, there were 11 governors that had signed strong pro-life legislation into place, including uh, Bob, your governor here in Governor Iowa. Kim Reynolds. If you know how to talk about it and you're passionate about it, it is a way to connect, as you said, with a majority of voters. And to that point, Marie, I want to ask uh, you a question on, on this uh, about the Hispanic community. Where are they on the life issue? Well, the Hispanic community, like I said before, is very strong in protecting their born, their children, right? I mean, if you think about it, most immigrants come to this country because they want to feed their children. So they're very protective of their children. They're, I feel that we have been fooled by a party making false promises to a lot of the Hispanic communities, and they kind of oversee the abortion side, not thinking, that that same person that is promising to take care of your family now here, right? Like making a sanctuary city for the immigrants because I want to protect you, but at the same time, I want to kill your children, right? Mm. Now we have to keep uh, in mind that in the last presidential election for the first time, the Hispanic broke a record. 16.6 .6 million of Hispanics voted for the first time, making it 30% more than any other presidential election, which means we made a difference when it comes to this candidate. That the message always to my people when I go around speaking is, if that politician is not willing to protect the most vulnerable person in your family, he does not care about you. That's right. mm. It's just a speech. So, what would they like to hear from the candidates on this issue of life? Well, obviously, like many people, is that they will protect all their families, born and unborn. I mean, Hispanics are very angry at what's happening to their children, born and unborn. You know, it's like, don't mess with our children. You know, we have a thing in Hispanic that is like, if you mess with my children, I will take your shoe, my shoe and throw it at you, right? Because we're very protective. That, that's what our most precious thing, right? And then also, we're large families. That's who we are. I mean, I love saying that I have over 40 cousins. I have never met half of them, but I love saying it. <laughs> that's who we are. It's our culture. So to many Hispanic Latinos, it, it is an attack to our culture. It's like saying we don't want you having large families because you're too many. To be abortion to many Hispanics is eugenics. It's classicist. It's racist. Is, is it just coincidence that we see Planned Parenthood putting clinics in Hispanic communities? Well, no, call it a coincidence. They hired me because I spoke Spanish and I could attract the Hispanic community to their doors and tell them to free themselves from slavery inside their kitchen. You know? So, no, it's not. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that Mexico, the border with Guatemala, it's approving abortions up to nine months to kill Guatemalan children. It's not a coincidence that the border with San Diego, Tijuana, it's approving abortions up to nine months to kill the children too that come there from sex exploitation. It's not a coincidence that all this International Prampiring Federation has pushed their business all over Latin America and pushed hard to pass legislations legalizing abortion up to birth. Wow. All right, we're going to go to some of our questions from our audience. What can we do in the states when your legislators don't support life? I send emails, sign petitions, and make phone calls, but in California, legislation under the left, and Gavin Newsom goes from bad to worse. There are two things that I think that uh, you begin with. One is you make sure that you are really engaged in helping a president win, <laughs> helping a president that could establish a minimum standard that would affect your state. And don't give up on your legislators because sometimes it's the long race, it's a long haul. But, that, but doing both is really important. The other thing I would say is dig in on serving women. It, it, this, is, this is not the election, but dig in in your local community and helping to provide the resources to women and children 
comprehensive across the board, all the things they need. They need us giving them the better answer than what Planned Parenthood gives. They give you a pill, they show you the door, or they pull your baby apart uh, surgically, and then they show you the door, and that's the end of your relationship with them. We have so much to offer, and we have so many doors out of their what um, Susan B. Anthony and her ilk called the immiseration of women. It's the complete misery that ends in the death of their own children. We have so much more to offer. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add if you don't mind. Sure. Um, the pro-life movement in California is very strong. You know, um, one thing they should do is to start electing their officials better. And if they run away from their state, please don't come to Arizona and vote for the same kind of politicians. <laughs> you know, because we're not getting anywhere doing that. But I think that a lot of people in California have lost faith in the voting system uh, between the Hispanic Latino community. They don't go out and vote because they think their vote doesn't matter. The vote doesn't count. And that's what we need to. We need to educate the community that their vote does count that their voices will be heard. And if they can make a difference, that's by electing the right politician, because most pro-life politicians are left out by themselves on the polls, and that's why they become afraid of defending and standing for life. I love it that this question comes from California. It's a different environment than it is in Iowa. And after Roe v. Wade got overturned, right away we thought, what an opportunity for the church to be the church to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So if I live in California, engage your church. Engage your church like crazy. Love on women. Be there for them. Do whatever you can. And then don't give up. Like Marjorie said, don't give up. As we tell our boys, we had four boys. Darla argues she had five, we had four. But, should wait for the laughter. Okay, so, but we tell our, our four boys, you will never be right when you do what's wrong. But you will never be wrong when you do what's right. So to keep the focus on those legislators, don't give up in doing that. But then three, what Marjorie said, take a real interest in what happens in Iowa, in the selection process for the presidential candidate. In Iowa, I'm gonna give you a challenge in this room to stand up for people in California. What we have learned in Iowa, candidates do not become more conservative and they do not become more pro-life once they get elected to office. Mm -hmm. This is our time to have this conversation, to have our debate, not just to stand up for babies in Iowa, but up for babies in California and every other state as well. We have a real task yeah. ahead of us. What, what he said. So I introduced a bill, Tony, um, limiting abortion on demand at 20 weeks. I got 52 votes. You got to get 60 votes to get the final passage in the Senate. People tell me, well, you don't have 60 votes. I said, you're right. One day I will. It took us 12 years to ban partial birth abortion. It took us 50 years to get the court in a position to overturn a constitutionally unsound concept called Roe v. Wade. Mm. I'm in it for the long haul, but here's what I would tell everybody in the pro-life movement. This is a defining moment in the movement. If you buy the idea that it is a state issue only, then it never really was about the child. Right. This is a moment of reflection. You can be a minority voice in California, but you can still be heard. The nominee of the Republican Party must, must be for the child, not about geography. So you can start the process in Iowa. Bob's got a big crowd. If you're coming to Iowa and campaigning for president in July, you'll be asked, is there a federal role um, in protecting the unborn? I would say Dobbs clearly says there is. I would say common sense says there is. And I'm hoping that from tonight forward, people who want to be president that come through Iowa have certain expectations. If you're pro-life and you say you're pro-life, you must act consistently with that statement. That means you will support legislation protecting the unborn child. And all I'm asking you to do is put our country in line with 47 of 50 European nations. All I'm asking you to do is reject the barbarity of China and North Korea. To my Democratic friends, you have lost your way. Well done. Thank you, Senator.
Uh, Bob, I just want to tag on to what we were discussing sure. here about the role of the church. One of the things that can be done, and as we realize in this post-Roe world, abortion has not been eliminated. It is simply now in the hands of the people and their elected representatives. We've got to keep doing what we've been doing for 50 years. We've got to continue to fund and expand the Care Pregnancy Network all across this country, loving the women and their children. Adoption needs to be an aggressive undertaking by the church. And so there's a lot of work to be done. Policy is part of it, but walking alongside these women is, uh, is a key part of building this culture of life, continuing to build it. I, I've got a yes. Yeah, I just, I wanna add to that, because we, we have to say it, when you say 50 years of work, that sounds like I'm tired, <laughs> but there is no tired now. It is a time to yes. refresh, restore, dig deep, read again all those scriptures that were exciting to you in the very beginning. Remember the first day it dawned on you, oh my gosh, that child is being ripped apart and that child was sent to this world for a purpose unique to him. Just dig in. Refresh. I say this to myself. I say this to everybody on the stage. We could get tired, but there is no tired because we have to not only this, do this ourselves, but we have to bring in more and more and more of this movement and the new generation and the old generation and all of us because this is the moment. This is the testing time that you said. This is the turning point where we either save lives or we let 63 million more die in the next 50 years. Okay, so I, I want to piggyback on that yeah. because it's no time to be tired. It is time to be inspired. Right. Do you realize that we are on the back end of 50 years of prayer? Right. Prayer warriors to overturn Roe v. Wade. And for some reason, God has given us a front row seat at this time to see Roe v. Wade overturn. For such a time as this, consider yourself Esther for a second. For such a time as this. Let's stand in for the sanctity of human life and let's find a champion who believes that they believe that they believe and there'll be a champion for every life. A majority of abortions in this com country were conducted through the abortion pill. How do we address that going forward in this next phase of building a culture of life? Well, we know that 54% are dying from this double pill, double barreled shot to these kids, and um, and it is and it is the biggest threat to our uh, to our success. So there are many fronts. There certainly is a lot of work that can be done on the federal level to stop it. Is also what your what your governor here has done um, when you when you have a. a a heartbeat bill or life at conception, there are a lot of illegal abortions happening through pills. Um, there, there are, um, uh, there, because of what we're seeing with women going into emergency room at five times the rate of um, surgical abortions, uh, ER visits are out the roof. That means that um, that on the federal level, we have got to rein in through the FDA uh, the. Um, the bad acting and the uh, and reestablish uh, the rules that were there to at least protect women in terms of uh, of their own uh, just their own protection. So the, the the Biden administration in pushing these pills out and turning mm -hmm. neighborhood drugstores into abortion clinics yeah. is pushing yeah. is putting women's lives at risk. That's right. And post offices are now abortion facilitators. Uh, there, there is no regulation over this, and it is definitely something that a federal candidate can, uh, a presidential candidate can communicate that, uh, that they are not going to allow the children to be killed and the women to go without any protection, without any physician's uh, visit, no pre, no post, um, pill, abortion. These women, of course, are in their, you know, their, their apartments or their bedrooms or their bathrooms or their abortion mills. Mm. So they're living where they have lost their children. They often see the beautifully formed child in their toilet and they flush it away. How traumatic. So we have to do something and they're, they're a presidential candidate could, number one, make sure that they are communicating what this is and the lawlessness in the country. Uh, and second, when he becomes president or she becomes president, do something through HHS to stop it. Yes. May I add on that? 
Um, also, you, I would like to see some elected officials go hard on all those websites that we know they exist on DIY abortions. You know, they tell women how to do the abortion pill at home, where to get them. You know, all those websites selling the abortion pill from China, from Mexico illegally, and we know they're there and they're promoted, and no one does anything about it to to go after them, right? Uh, but also, you know, after 16 years of promoting abortions, because the truth is I sold abortions for 16 years, then I became the director of an abortion facility, I realized what I had been promoting and selling, and I realized there's no such a thing as a safe abortion. There's no such a thing at any stage. Women are at risk all the time. There's not a pill made for an abortion that it's safe. There's not a surgical procedure it's safe. Abortions are not safe. It's not about a matter of being done in a facility legally or uh, illegally. The fact is that abortion can never be a safe procedure. Mm -hmm. well, let's just think about it. What we're talking about, how to do it, when to do it, and should you do it. That's what I'm in business for. That shouldn't be decided by a bunch of judges, non-elected, it should be decided by people like me. If you don't like what I do, you can kick me out. That's the way we do business in America, and it should be this issue too. So I just want to reinforce our Democratic colleagues have taken the most extreme position imaginable in Washington. They literally would abort a baby up to the moment of birth using taxpayer dollars, and not one of them will tell you what week they would limit. Right. I want to show up in Washington. There's nothing in the Dobbs decision to suggest I don't have a voice. It's quite the opposite. It says, or Congress. So I'm going to show up in Washington, and I'm going to lend my voice to this cause. I'm going to say states have a leeway to do what they want to do up to a point. Because then it becomes about what kind of country you live in. Do you want to live in a country that allows a baby to be aborted in the 36th week using your money? No. Why does 70% of the people, 80% of the people reject that? Because it offends them. Yeah. We're not going to have policy built around 20% of the country. To my Republican colleagues, you can win on this issue only if you'll talk about it. Right. Amen. When you're asked about abortion, the answer is not we need to build a wall. <laughs> we do need to build a wall. But you need to give the public an honest, sincere answer to a question that is fundamental to the nation. When does life begin? How's it regulated? The Republican Party has championed right. the unborn, but all of a sudden it was the deer in the headlights look after the Dobbs decision. It's simply going back, we're here to protect unborn life. It's real simple, straightforward. Do you remember during the partial birth abortion debate, Rick Santorum asked Barbara Boxer, when do you think there, there should be a, a baby becomes a baby? And she said, when you come, when you take it home, when you take it to the, take it home from the hospital. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So if we force them to define themselves, be right. relentless, always ask, what is your position? They will never tell you. They won't be that dumb because they don't want you to know. Right. And they've avoided that because we've enabled them to do that by not talking about where we stand on the issue. And I, I just want to emphasize, Senator, what you said so everybody is very, very clear on this. The, 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 the position of the President of the United States is abortion until birth funded by you. That's never been the standard before in the past, but that is the standard now, and that's what they're trying to impose on the nation and wipe out all pro-life laws, including those here in Iowa. And if the baby's born alive, they also will vote to fail to help. They won't help right. even the baby Deny born alive. Deny the baby alive. help, yeah. medical care. Myra, I'm gonna to go to a question that's come in for, for you. Having worked at, uh, Planned Parenthood clinics, we're told uh, that 73% of the women who choose abortion do so for financial reasons. That's their motive. In your experience working at Planned Parenthood, is that true? No. No, actually, the majority of women electing abortion are because it's not convenient for them right now, whether it's whatever they're doing in their life. Uh, it is true that it has to do with the partner not being supportive. The majority of them 
there's usually a partner that is not gonna be there with them, and that one makes them decide for the abortion. But financial reasons, I wouldn't say that it's as high as 73%, no. No, especially, I mean, in our country, you know, coming from, I'm Mexican if my accent didn't give me away. <laughs> I, I didn't know, I thought yeah, you were no. from South Iowa. Well, because I became a citizen last month, and I'm now an Americana. Right, congratulations. So, but, but coming from countries, you know, like Latin America, honestly, when you have seen poverty, really poverty, we are lucky in this country. This country is very, very lucky. We have done so much social justice for people, you know, that people really can have uh, food on their table. You know, they don't have to travel to another country and move there to work to be able to put a plate of food on their table. So really, do we come down to really that financial when the government is there to provide you with SNAP, with food stamps, with all that financial right. help if you decide to have your children? And that's part of what she was saying. There's so many resources there that we will guide them to find the financial resources. That, that brings up another question that uh, just came in. When you look at what Planned Parenthood did this last year, Senator, $670.4 million tax dollars went to Planned Parenthood, a record amount of money. They're sitting on $2.3 billion in assets, a lot of that coming out of your paychecks. Isn't there something that can be done, even including as we talk about the presidential stage, that some of these monies can go to these care pregnancy centers to help guide women to these resources and let them know they're not alone so that they will choose life? Yes, if you win, no if you lose, Right. okay? If you lose, you can't expect policies to be like you would want them. You gotta win. So here's what I hope to get out of this. Plant the flag at Iowa. If you wanna be the nominee of the Republican Party, carry our banner, you've gotta give a clear, concise, logical answer on the pro-life issue in Washington, D.C. And if you can't do that, then maybe you shouldn't be in the race to begin with. Because when you come to South Carolina, we're gonna ask you point blank, would you sign federal legislation protecting the unborn who can feel pain at 15 weeks, suck their thumb, and uh, I'm hoping everybody will say yes by then. But this is a defining moment in the Republican Party, Medicaid. There are a bunch of states cutting off money to abortion providers under the Medicaid program, it's going to the Supreme Court. I think we're gonna win. Mm -hmm. The court is the most receptive to the pro-life movement I have seen. The public is more supportive than ever being against late-term abortion. What are we worried about? Right. Everything is falling in place except leadership. Mm. And, and Let it be said that Iowa insists on leadership. Tony, if I can follow up to that, and I want to give a challenge to Iowans, because uh, Senator Graham, you're, you're exactly right. That was exceptionally well said. But I don't think the Dobbs decision made the politician nervous. I think Kansas did. I think Kentucky right. did. Absolutely. I think Nebraska did. Absolutely. I think that's what made the politician right. nervous. And they started drawing, like, do I really believe what I believe? Because you know what? I may not win if I believe that. So now we're gonna ask these people, and I told you, you know, we're welcoming in Iowa, and as Marjorie already said, you know, Pence, Hutchison, um, Tim Scott, they're all really good. We're giving a lot of grace. Governor DeSantis signed a heartbeat bill, okay? But they're still trying to find their sea legs, but we're gonna help them find their sea legs to be a champion for the sanctity of human life. But then we as a pro-life community need to get behind them and help them win. Motive, mo mobilize like never before to help them win. And that way our message to every mom is that little girl in your womb, she's a baby. And we'll do everything we can to help protect her. We're talking about what we want to see. Let's talk for a moment, uh, present company excluded, of those who are doing it well those who are talking about the governors, the elected leaders at the federal level and at the state level that are talking about this and leading well. I mean, let's, sometimes the power of an example is, is extremely motivating. I don't think anybody did better than Senator Rubio in Florida. He did a beautiful job in debate against his opponent, Val Demings. He did 
he, he had the eloquence of Lindsey Graham and the passion of a, uh, a Cuban um, background. He was unafraid. He showed that contrast. Um, and, uh, and he won. She, they, you know, they thought he was going under. He won by large margins. Mm. And they thought this was the issue that was going to take him down. Same for Kemp, the governor of, of uh, Georgia. Signed a heartbeat bill, very purple state, purplish trending state these days. Uh, he did a great job, unapologetic. He was in the game the whole time supporting that bill. So when it actually got to his desk, it wasn't like, yeah, I'll passively wait here for to, to sign it. He was in it. He was advocating for it. That's what we need in a national pro-life leader. We need a national pro-life champion that invites that bill to their desk. And I just want to add one thing. From Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America standpoint, any, any candidate who wants to qualify from our perspective of being a candidate has to at least be for the 15 week limit. Otherwise, we will not support you. And I don't know if you can win. You tell me, can you win a, uh, the presidency without the pro-life movement? Well, it, not only will you lose the people who make the phone calls and knock on the doors, you know, money takes you only so far. The best thing can happen to a politician is for somebody to get on the phone and advocate for you. That's better than any ad. You will break the hearts of everybody who's been with us for 50 years. You'll, you'll, you'll suck the life, no pun intended, out of the movement itself for no good reason. It's not like I'm asking you to jump in a bat of acid. I'm asking you to go where the biggest crowd is. For a politician, you know what I like? A bigger crowd's better than a smaller crowd. More votes are better than less votes. The abortion issue being handled by the Democratic Party is a political gift. Mm -hmm. They have taken the most extreme position you can imagine, and most of us are afraid to confront them with it because of what uh, Bob said. This is a winning issue politically. It is. It is the right thing to do. It puts you in line with the civilized world. For God's sakes, people, demand of those who want to lead a great party to be bold. Yeah. So, Tony, I, I get a chance to meet with all these presidential hopefuls. And one thing I tell them is that if you want to win Iowa, the Iowa caucuses, I would emulate Governor Reynolds. And the reason is because she is exceptionally popular. She's bold, she's courageous. And these guys will remember in 2018, she was running against a guy named Fred Hubble. Fred Hubble was the chair of the state Planned Parenthood. And in the third debate, when they asked Kim Reynolds, what's your line in the sand? She said, the sanctity of human life. And she went from three points down to Fred Hubble to beating Fred Hubble by three points. Think of the difference our state would be under Hubble versus wow. Reynolds. Yeah. Stark, right? But not only did she sign the heartbeat bill, she has been a champion for the sanctity of human life at every turn. She's been ahead of us. She's been challenged our Supreme Court. If you want to emulate somebody to win Iowa, I'd say emulate Governor Kim Reynolds and embedded in her is being a champion for life. Well, I, I'm going to have to bring this in for a landing here, and I, I, I want to first do this. We have the results from our poll. Uh, do you think Congress has a role in protecting the unborn? This may come as a surprise, but 96% of those participating tonight <laughs> say absolutely Congress has a role. I'm going to give each of you a, a moment to make a closing statement, and then I'm going to wrap us up here tonight. Senator? So, so thank you to the church. Uh, you're making history. This is the 21st of June, right? Mm -hmm. 2023. Let it be said that the price of admission to being competitive in Iowa was set tonight. Okay? And all we're asking of our standard barrier is to be unafraid, he or she, to look the camera in the eye and articulate a position that most people in the country believe is the right position. And if you're on stage with Joe Biden in a debate, first thing you need to say, hey, Joe, I'm over here. <laughs> You've been asked three times, pal. 
is his favorite word. When would you limit abortion? You have to give an answer to the American people. Listen to what I'm telling you. I believe America is a great nation, and I, as your president, will make sure that any baby, no matter where you're conceived, who can suck their thumb and feel pain will be protected by the laws of the United States. We will not be a barbaric nation. So I hope my husband is watching tonight because I'm going to say something I've never said before. I have nothing to add. <laughs> well done. <laughs> that was funny. Well, I told you I just became a citizen, so I will be voting pro-life 2024. Yay. We will stay on this fight until it becomes unthinkable. That's what we're all here for. Yeah. So abortion is unthinkable. I'd like to use the balance of Marjorie's time. <laughs> no, I think, you know, Senator Graham, you're right. And Maya and Marjorie as well. Just a blessing to be up here with you. Thanks to the church. Tony, thank you for putting this on as well. Uh, Iowans, uh, we, we have a real responsibility. We want to find a champion for the sanctity of human life. We want them to believe it and to be very clear on it and to point out where the other side is and why the federal government has a role in this all the way to where one day we celebrate every life, every life. And will it win? Mike Huckabee says yes. Rick Santorum says yes. Ted Cruz says yes. You're a champion for the sanctity of human life. It will win in the great state of Iowa. Thank you, Bob, Myra, Marjorie, Senator Graham. Thank you all for being here tonight. Pastor thank you, Cole, Tony. Thank you for hosting us tonight. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. And I want to leave you with this thought as it's been touched upon tonight that, yes, this is an issue that we wrestle with in the public arena. But more importantly, we wrestle with this issue in the heavenlies. This is a spiritual issue that is defining of this nation. You know, Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And so we, we have to be equipped with that understanding that our strength may not be in necessarily in the voting booth. That is an out. That, that is how we work out our strength. Our strength is in the heavens and it's in our relationship with the Lord. But we need to realize that this is a spiritual battle, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. And I will say this without hesitancy, abortion comes from the pit of hell. And we must stand against the darkness in this hour. And I thank you for being here tonight. I thank Bob for leading the Iowans to take a stand for life. And I pray that you will put your thumbprint on America going forward by shaping the views of our candidates.